Hey guys, welcome to this very special episode of Talking Cars. Uh, and with me, unlike always, is my friend Alex from Alex on Autos. Tommy is on assignment. Thanks for joining us, Alex. Well, thanks for having me and uh, hello from the other coast. Yeah, and if you guys are looking for like real reviews of vehicles, you know, none that feature Andre on a girl's pink bike, <laughs> go over oh, to... I, I, I haven't seen that video. Tell me more. <laughs> why, why is Andre on a pink bike? <laughs> Sit back and relax or keep driving if you're driving. TFL Talking Cars is on the air, the world's most popular car podcast. Okay, maybe not yet, but we're working on it. Go over to go over to Alex's uh, YouTube channel, Alex on Autos. Uh, one of the best places for you know car and truck buying advice that I always check out. But today we've got Alex on uh, because we're going to be talking about the new Rogue. And Alex, you actually got to drive it and review it, uh, and it's I did. there. Uh, so let's 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 just dive deep into it, man. Let's start with the styling. What do you what do you think of the look of it? First, I think we all need a link to the video with the pink bike just down there in the in the doobly doo. So, uh, and right, then I let's will, dive into the rogue. I will, so, I, will, <laughs> I, will I will add a link to the pink bike video. Uh, I was, uh, and, and I will add a link to your review of the rogue as well. But check out the rogue review before you check. You know, I mean, I mean, you know what the rogue the the rogue review is the meat, uh, and the pink bike review would be like I don't know, like uh, Aussie man reviews. You know, something like that. Yeah. That's true. That's pleasure. True. I mean, the rogue, the rogue. I mean, depending on the the month we're taking a look at over about the last two three years, the rogue has been the best selling thing that isn't a truck, and I think currently it's the third best selling non truck thing in America. So Nissan's shifting a, a ton of them. And I think it's obvious that they're selling a lot of them because the redesign is not. No, there's nothing crazy about the rogue. There's nothing wacky styled. There's nothing you know astronomically mind blowing about any of it. It's all very calculated. Uh, mission to move the rogue forward and refine the things they wanted to refine and uh, and not not piss anybody off really to be honest so if you if you didn't like it before you're probably not going to like it but if you loved it before there's more rogue to love yeah let's like i said let's talk about the styling i've got it up yeah. on our, our, our uh, what do you think about the divorced headlamp look there where the headlight and the turn signal aren't in the same module you know uh it's so funny you know i uh, remember when uh dave uh, mark allen did that in the mm -hmm. first Cherokee, and then these pictures yeah. of the Cherokee came out from the factory, and everybody lost their you know what because they hated it yeah. so much. Uh, and now I'm, it's become a styling convention. Yeah, and it's and, and of course the Cherokee left it. The you know, Jeep, Jeep abandoned their invention, yeah. and but I, I have to agree that I don't think Jeep it didn't look right in some colors, especially. I think that was the problem. They had that that grayed out headlight thing rather than it being a clear element like we see in the Rogue on, on your photo there, you can see that the headlight is, that, that plastic is always clear. So there's definitely two modules all the time, regardless of the color. And the Cherokee looked really good in black, but in white, it sort of looked like a raccoon where you had like these black, black spots right there around the headlights. Um, I think that Nissan did a good job with the styling. It's square, it's boxier, it's butcher, for lack of a better word. Um, reminds me kind of of the transition that we see in the RAV4 to make it a little bit mini truck like because that's what yeah. people seem to be after. I also think that the reason or go that the reason it works is because in the Cherokee of course you had the round light, right? And then the yeah. kind of the squinty light. With yeah. here you've got two uh horizontal lights. Yeah. Uh, uh, and it, you know I also think it works in the Kona which actually copied it after the Cherokee. Uh, and so I'm yeah, less I think convinced on the Kona. I like this a bit more. Yeah, and you know they've kept their kind of traditional V uh, design language. Emotion. Yeah. Uh, I, I, you know, look, let me, let me ask you this. Okay. I have this belief that you can take any car and you can make it more masculine and it'll be more, uh, popular. People will like it more. It'll sell more. But if you go the other way, if you make it more feminine, it actually doesn't work. And, and I can pick examples of that. Like if you think about the Suzuki Samurai, right. And then they came up with the uh, what was it, the SX? You know, the one that had the topless, right? It became much more of a beach car and less of an off-roader. Uh, so it, what is, uh, what is, not to be sexist, trying not to be here, what is a Subaru Outback then? Is that a more masculine design? Because it sells really well. Well, it's, it's, it's a transition, right? It's when you go to the next generation. And if you, if you make it more, I, I, I don't want to be sexist, but, you know, there is <laughs> a definition of masculinity, right? It's more square-jawed. Uh, more yeah. uh, rough in some ways, less curvy, right? If you go that route, it tends to do much better than if you mm -hmm. go the other route. Um, and the I curvy elegance. 
Yeah, I don't know I why. I think is. there's some curve. I think there's some curvy elegance in the in the outback, though, uh, and in modern Volvo designs. I, I think. But I digress. I do like the look of the Rogue here better than the bubbly one before. I think bubbly cutesy is different. Bubbly cutesy doesn't work for me somehow. So this um, is, this is a horrible stereotype, but I'm going to say it anyway because I think. Sometimes, you know, stereotypes Please, are- Please, why stop now? <laughs> no, no, because sometimes they're, they're out there because they're true, right? I think, you know, obviously men and women look at vehicles differently. Uh, and when you make a vehicle more masculine, I think it appeals both to men and women. Whereas when you make it more feminine, uh, it doesn't seem to appeal to men as much. I, I don't know why that is. Uh, and I think- Could be. Uh, yeah, that's it. It, it. It's just kind of, you know- and everybody's receiving their auto news from dudes. So, you know, there are, there, there are certainly women in the industry, but, you know, right now on, on screen, we're, we're all dudes. So I mean, I mean another one, another <laughs> one that, that proves that point is the Viper, right? The Viper was this really yeah. kind of like, you know, I'm going to tear your head off. And then Ralph Gilles came along and designed this almost Ferrari-like, you know, beautiful shape. Yeah, swoopy thing. And people were really disappointed by it. They wanted that kind of, you know, they wanted the guy at the beach who mm -hmm. kicks sand in your face. Not the that woman that, lying. That was a very that was a very particular moment in time too. I mean, that's when we got the bubble Taurus and the, all the weird roundy things. And you know, FCA had a number of jelly bean like products, and everybody thought that the future was going to be just a series of ovals. And then all of a sudden, we decided to move back to straight lines. And then now we've got cars like like uh, the Rogue to a limited extent, but like Hyundai's latest crossovers, the Elantra and the, the new Tucson, et cetera. I mean, all they used were rulers in designing these things. It's so true, dude. So true. So, so, you know, I think styling more agreed, right? I think it looks better. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it's a little bit more purposeful. Uh, it's got a little bit cleaner lines. It, it, you know, it looks like it's got uh, more, uh, uh, you know, it looks like it knows where it's going as opposed yeah. to kind of being confused about <laughs> where it's but is, going. But is my love for more angular designs rooted in my misplaced nostalgia about 1980s cars? I don't know. <laughs> so what's your favorite 80s car? If, if you could buy, I'm going to give you a, a check for $20,000. Oh, you, dear. You get to go buy an 80s car. Oh. Which one would you get? Oh, no. And don't say, don't now say, that Mar I said that. Um, don't say Mark IV Supra. Maybe I'm so sick of that. an 80s Maserati, maybe an 80s Quattroporte. They were kind of good looking for the time. Okay. Um, I they were also a Jaguar some good guy. looking How angular 90s. If I could stretch it, I'd get a Fleetwood, but not the 80s because I didn't like the 80s ones. They were too small. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden in the 90s, that Fleetwood got enormous. Oh my God, it got huge. How about uh, a Jaguar? You, you know, you've got a I soft do place like in your heart Jags. for Jaguars. Yeah. But I think the 80s weren't a good era somehow no, for JAG. They were not yeah. good. Yeah. Well, um, that one retro could, mojo helped them later. One can argue that JAG has had very few days <laughs> that have been good for them <laughs> after the 50s and 60s. The XJ, recently. the X, when the XJ went back to the roundy headlights yeah. in the, the X, what, X350 and the one prior to the X308 series, those, those were good looking JAGs. I liked those. I had to. <laughs> All right, so I'll tell you what I'd have if I had an 80s car. My mom had it. She had a Subaru SBX. I thought that was really a cool oh, car. Oh, those were cool. Those yeah. were cool. So that window in window, you know. Yeah. yeah. What was the deal with that? What Did they both open? I forget. No, only the bottom part opened, and the idea was you could drive with your window open in the rain and not get wet. Oh, okay. I don't know why, but the, I think that was the, the theory behind it. A really yeah. cool car. I just like these cool kind of quirky cars that, you know, because it was a Japanese, you know, car designed by Italians, uh, and, and you get those kind of funky combinations, yeah. and sometimes you get a little bit of magic, and sometimes, like with the Citroen DS, uh, when they went from the French car to the was it the Maserati engine? Was the Maserati? It was the Maserati engine, right? That one was a horrible uh, confluence oh, yeah, yeah. of two different, yeah. you know, engineering types. Anyway, so um, the back one to the part, road. <laughs> yeah, the one part about the Rogue that I don't have the interior pictures, unfortunately, but the one part that I really love about it is the interior. Uh, there's kind of this diamond yeah. uh, pattern that they've sewn into the seats. It, it, it looks like they've really taken it up, a, not just one level, but maybe like mm -hmm. two levels or three levels. Depending on how much of my exquisite and professional footage is left on the cutting room floor at TFL, uh, you'll see that when the video goes live on, what, Monday, I think, right? Yep. It goes live on Monday. Yeah, this um, is but going yeah, the on Monday. I thought was a real high point. I was, I was really, Alex, really impressed. This, this is, that's today. Just oh, point. today. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Time travel. <laughs> yes. When it, when it goes live today, yes. <laughs> you will see it now. Yes. You, you can watch the video as we're talking. <laughs>
<laughs> All right, so go, um, go talk about the interior. Please. But yeah, the interior was really, really shocking to me because I had expected it to be an incremental improvement on the Rogue. But um, honestly, it was better than than some areas of the Lexus RX hybrid that I drove down there to actually review that. So I was reviewing an RX hybrid, drove that down to the Rogue event, and discovered two things that I was not expecting in that uh, there were some plastics in the Lexus RX that were actually a little cheesier than the Rogues. Okay. And I found the Rogue seats to be more comfortable, which really shocked me. Yeah, they're you know, anti-gravity or zero gravity, if I, were, if I recall zero, the marketing. Zero gravity. Yeah, yeah so they're you're marketing you're, NASA inspired. You know. <laughs> you're in space, right? Um, yes. <laughs> Uh, one of the engineers misspoke and was like, NASA engineered. And those, no, NASA inspired. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really brilliant marketing term because anything can be, you know, inspired, yes. right? <laughs> yes, NASA inspired, yes. <laughs> pick, your, um, pick, pick, pick your most expensive uh, program in the world and it can be inspired by that. And I know this sounds crazy, but the one thing that disappointed me in the interior of the Rogue is that there is no third seat in this generation at all, it looks like. They wouldn't comment on other world markets but it certainly looks based on the design, like it was just not built for a third row to ever be back there. And even though the third row in the old Rogue was, you know, somewhere between useless and almost useless, I kind of like the idea of having that emergency third row that you can jam people back there if you really do need to carry seven people somewhere. It's not like it was used all the time, but I thought it was a differentiating feature that was kind of cool. Yeah, but wouldn't you say there's this long list of cars where they've tried to put a third row into basically a, a, a you know, a midsize or small crossover and it just never works i mean they do it because they figure that if you if you put it out into the dealership then people who want that ability will have it but do they ever use it that's a, I, yeah, I don't know i mean i know i know customers that have that have written in claiming they had the rogue and they they want another thing that size and their only option is a volkswagen tiguan now so and if you want it it is in the tiguan and it's uh, as i recall standard on the front wheel drive models and optional on all wheel drive so Reasonable numbers of those are, are moving since that's approaching, you know, uh, Volkswagen's best-selling model. But everybody else has said, hey, if you want the third row, buy the bigger one in the lineup. Yeah, I just, I just like, I remember going to the launch of the current generation of Range Rover, uh, and they offered a third row, and they had it there, but I have never seen that vehicle outside of the launch of the, of the Range Rover. Uh, because I just, I just think what, what people end up doing is, if you want that third row, you're going to go after the Tahoe. You know, I mean, at that mm -hmm. point... If you really want it, you, you really want to be like able to put humans in there, not not you know your 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 legless kids, right? Because that's how right. those things are. Uh, and and right. then the opposite of that, of course, is that well, it's got this, this extra utility, but uh, I don't know, dude. I mean, it'd be like I'd be embarrassed to stick anybody back there. Right? Oh, I wouldn't. <laughs> I mean, that, that's that, that's 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 the sort of like, hey, we're all going to lunch. Do we take one car or two cars? You know, uh, the in-laws are in town. You know, jam someone in the back so we don't have to take two cars. You know, I could do it. That's why, I, I mean, theoretically, that's why I got the Durango for its, its third row. It's not great in the Durango, but, you know, it's there. And, hey, you can stick people back there if you need to. So, so uh, you know, I, I, even in like uh, Durango, which is actually pretty good, or let's talk about like the Tahoe or Suburban or mm -hmm. any of the big ones, right? Getting back there, especially uh, if you're athletically challenged, is always a little bit of a... <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's, there's a sort of a pole vaulting gymnast -y vibe to get into the third row, you know, in some cars. Yeah. Um, yeah so, so the only car we've ever had, I'm serious, the only car we ever had at the office where people were like, hey, let's all take one car. Can you guess what vehicle that was? Uh, the, Minivan. No, it was, but you're close. You're close. Oh. You're almost there. Full size uh, uh, Sprinter van. Everybody, uh, okay, okay, everybody, okay. Everybody was like, yeah, 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 yeah. Because that's just, you walk in, you sit down, right? Yeah. There's, there's none of this. All like, rows are equal at this point. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, so if, if you really want to take your colleagues to work, get yourself a Sprinter. <laughs> I could see, I could see that, you know, even, even the, um, the full size SUVs don't have, you know, fabulous third rows or anything. Uh, the X7 though does have a really nice third row. The X7 I was really, really, just, really impressed with that. Really nice vehicle in general, right? It's, yeah. It's, it's well. It better because boy, is it expensive. <laughs> yeah. 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 Actually, you know, the uh, third row in the Palisade and uh, Telluride isn't mm -hmm. too bad either. Uh, if, if you're going to have Headroom to could be a little better, but legroom is excellent. Yeah, yeah. All right. So now we've kind of dissected the interior. Uh, let's talk about, uh, oh, let, before we get to the competition, which is the one I'm really curious about, let's talk about mm -hmm. the powertrain, right? So uh, more yes. power, more, got rid of the CVT because people hate it, right? No? No. no. <laughs> uh, we have a, a teeny bit more power and a Susan more uh, torque, but basically a very similar two and a half liter turbo engine. 
And of course, um, if people want the hybrid, it's available. You want the hybrid? Uh, no, uh, hang on a second. <laughs> I'm getting distracted. Hang on a second. Hey, Rob, can you move it to another office, please? <laughs> you <need> Sorry. <laughs> My office is on the other side. And so when this is in occupied, there tends to be telephone talking over there. <laughs> and, and, I, and I hit you with, uh, you know, obviously there's no hybrid okay. this time. So I was, I was just kind of, you know, yes, I know. giving you, giving you a softball there to, to hit out of the ballpark, and then Rob came into it. But Got it. yeah, there, unfortunately, the, the hybrid didn't sell very well in the last generation uh, because yep. it didn't offer much in the way of fuel economy. <laughs> yeah, the old hybrid didn't really offer an improvement in fuel economy. And actually, I think that this new two and a half liter turbo gets very, or sorry. Two and a half liter turbo, wishful thinking again. Uh, the two and a half liter engine that we find under the hood has a little bit more power, a little bit more torque, and a little bit better fuel economy. So that's why no hybrid, I think, because I think the old hybrid was about the same fuel economy as this newer two and a half liter turbo. There I go again. Two and a half liter engine, non turbo. Uh, yeah, okay. Everybody else is going turbo, not Nissan. Yeah, and actually, uh, I think the, the Koreans are going back to naturally aspirated V6s, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so they went to turbos, not going back to... It's hard to keep track, dude. It really is. It is. Uh, it is. But the Tucson is going to get their new 2.5 liter turbo, rumors say, and it's going to be the direct competitor to the Rogue. Yeah, so speaking of competitors, uh, that's a great segue. Uh, let's talk about the, kind of the, the gorillas in the room, right? So w w once mm -hmm. upon a time in America, uh, the most popular vehicles were, of course, full-size, um, not full-size, um, um, Whatever you call them, uh, mid-size sedan, mid mid yeah. sedans, right? There's like Camry Accord. Or, yeah, there's like there's like 13 of them. You know what yep. those are. Uh, but uh, recently, that's shifted to uh, this class of crossover. So you know the three, yep. the three, four big ones, of course, are uh, Honda CRV, right? Uh, uh, Toyota Rav4, Nissan Rogue, and General Motors is in the mix of all things. Yeah, the Equinox is number four. Yeah, it's hard. Uh, to, it's hard to believe that yeah. GM actually uh, is uh, you know coming in into the ball game here. So I'm. I'm I'm uh, really curious to see, you know, if this segment's going to keep expanding and if it's going to keep growing. And I think it is. Wouldn't you agree? I think it is. Uh, you know, there's there's a lot to say for this format of crossover. You know, it's it's priced similarly to the Camry and Accord, but we've got at least double the cargo area, a bigger, more generously sized back seat that's easier to get in and out of, easier to get kids in and out of. So if you're that active family ideal, they make a lot of sense. And then of course, everybody seems to want all-wheel drive, even if you live in San Diego your entire life, all-wheel drive is now a must-have for everything. And uh, crossovers you know, started as that mini SUV, mini trucklet thing, so they've kept all-wheel drive, even as they've become more car-like in their, their design and their nature, um, that all-wheel drive has stuck around. So. Uh, if you want uh, an Altima with all-wheel drive, uh, you can finally do one now, only because really of the success of the Rogue and their desire to try and keep some of those shoppers in that car. But you can really thank Rogue and RAV4 and CRV for the reason that we now have all-wheel drive in Camry and Altima. Yeah, and I also think part of that is people uh, look at it as a, um, uh, look as, as, as prestigious, right? So uh, once upon a time, you could get the premium cars and like rear wheel drive nowadays, almost all premium right. cars are all wheel drive. And I think that's kind of come down to, you know, the regular cars. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so let me ask you, speaking of that, how does it drive dude? It, uh, it's not as soft and wallowy as it was before, but it's yeah. still softer than softer than the RAV4, I would say. So it's still tuned towards the, towards the comfortable side of things. Um, the interior was quieter than I had expected. I haven't had it at home. So I haven't tested on the same roads that I always test cars on. Uh, but down there in Los Angeles, the interior surprised me uh, in its quietness. It's not overly peppy. It's at least a full second slower than a RAV4. Um, so it is not going to win any speed races. But the flip side of that is decent fuel economy. So if you're driving it out on the open highway at a steady 65 to 70 miles an hour, fuel economy is seemingly better than the RAV4. So there's a bit of a trade-off there. Um, and it's big. It's definitely has a roomy feel to it inside, which you don't see in the RAV4. Uh, the RAV4 is tight, uh, has really tight back seats, I thought. Um, so the, if you're looking for something with a bit more passenger room or better child seat room, especially, the, the Rogue is probably going to be the winner there. Um, handling was decent. They all have relatively wide tires, which did surprise me a bit. Uh, I hadn't expected the Rogue to have 235 tires on all trims. Uh, it's definitely wider than you'll find in the RAV4 or a lot of the base trims of the competition. So absolute grip isn't is actually pro is actually pretty good for the segment. It just doesn't have that sharp handling feel that you might be expecting out of 
say a Mazda CX-5? Yeah, let's, let's do a little bit of a uh, sidebar here because I think it's interesting uh, and it does kind of um, dovetail with this vehicle. We just had the uh, RAV4 Prime. Have you gotten behind the wheel of that? Yes, and it's coming back again. Oh, good for you, yeah. Uh, you know, and, and if I were to look down the list of cars that we've had this year, I would say that that is definitely one of the top, I was going to say five, I'm going to say top three cars that we reviewed this year. Mm -hmm. I just think that Toyota really uh, nailed it out of the ballpark with that vehicle. Not only is it fuel efficient, obviously the prime means that it's got, I think what, 40 some miles of all electric range. Yeah, uh, and, nearly 40, yep. Yeah, and, and Toyota's using that electric power also to, to speed up uh, acceleration. So it's remarkably quick. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, you know, it, it seems like for the first time, the world's biggest car manufacturer has gotten serious about electricity, right? There have been other prime models, obviously. There's been the like the Prius Prime, right, which mm -hmm. which was just, it, it made no sense because it didn't have enough range or enough uh, fuel economy benefit to, to offset the incredible cost for it. Um, so what, what's your thinking of the Prime? You think the Toyota, this is, you think this is the direction the Toyota is going? Or is this just like somebody at, at Toyota said, hey, <laughs> Why don't we build one of these and see if it'll fly? And then all of a sudden, the first 5,000 sold out like that. And now everybody's like, we want more. I mean, Toyota has been, Toyota has been pretty upfront that this is their path and that they're going to do it on their time and on their schedule, not on anybody else's schedule, it seems. Um, Toyota's also this incredibly pragmatic engineering company that loves to think about holistic solutions and solving everything for for um, Toyota in its in its larger impact on the world, et cetera. So, they uh, their 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 big corporate push has been hybridization first, then plug-in hybrids, then maybe full EVs and other things later. Um, the logical reason is that if batteries are a finite resource, you can have a bigger impact on fuel consumption if you push hybrids out to everything in the lineup. So the the big push for Rav4 hybrids, for instance, now 26% I think of all Rav4 sales in the U.S. Are hybrids. So it's a huge number of hybrids. And, and we that has say, a bigger impact on fuel economy than actually all the Teslas that ship the same year. And we should say you've got a long-term RAV4, so you're really familiar with this. Yeah, so we have a RAV4 hybrid. I got it because it's it's the bit you know theoretically the biggest volume hybrid in the U.S. Depending on exactly how you want to talk about the Ram 1500 e-torque thing, um, either one of those is going to be the highest volume hybrid in the United States right now. Um, but shifting shifting a hundred um, thousand hybrids actually has a bigger impact on fuel consumption in the U.S. than shipping a much smaller number of full battery electric vehicles. It's just not as sexy as the problem. So the RAV4 plug-in hybrid brings a little bit of that sexy by giving it faster acceleration, the EV range that people seem to want, while still fitting somewhere into Toyota's pragmatism in engineering. I was really surprised though how practical it ends up being because it still has the spare tire. Uh, it hasn't lost any cargo room, which I thought was shocking. Um, because they positioned the battery completely under the RAV4. So they did a really good job engineering it. Yeah, and, uh, you know, I think what a fully electric car uh, that has real range, you know, whether it's, uh, a, a, you know, a, a plug-in hybrid or a full electric car, uh, car, the advantage that it has is that, like, like right now, and I'm sure you're, you know, you're in the San Francisco Bay Area, right? And we're here in Colorado, Alex. And I can't breathe the air outside today. It's so bad. We've got this horrible fire uh, in uh, kind of north of Colorado Springs. It's just, you know, burning right now. It's been burning for the last three weeks or four weeks. And every other day I wake up and I can't go outside because it's so, so bad. Uh, and and I, I'm being honest about this. I feel bad driving uh, uh, a car out there because I keep thinking to myself, you know, I'm burning all these fossil fuels. I'm increasing the amount of carbon that's in the air. And we're just making this climate change worse. So, you know, getting behind the wheel of an electric car just uh, makes me feel like I'm, the little thing I can do to help the environment I'm doing. Uh, mm -hmm. And, I, you know, I don't want to have the argument about, I think that's a, that's a kind of a false argument about whether, you know, you're moving the, the, the pollution downstream, but if you're mm -hmm. using renewable mm -hmm. energy, you're certainly not. Uh, and so I feel good doing that. Uh, and, and the RAV4 works that way, right? With 40 it does, miles it range, does. Yeah. I, I, I could drive it to work, I can drive it back home, I can plug it in and do the same thing the next day and never touch that gasoline engine ever. But it doesn't, plug-in hybrids don't seem to have that same patting on the back feel though. It doesn't feel like you've gone cold turkey. You know, <laughs> I've always thought this, Americans love this thought of, <laughs> of, of you're on and then you're off. There's no mitigation, there's no reduction. We want to go cold turkey. You don't want to smoke less, you want to stop smoking. 
You know, you don't want to drink less. You want to stop drinking, right? So um, the gasoline consumption fits into that window. Even if in a practical world, you buy a plug-in hybrid because, you know, batteries are a finite resource and we want to help everybody and be pragmatic and holistic about our approach to climate change, blah, 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 blah. So I'm going to buy a plug-in hybrid, not a full battery electric vehicle. No, I want the full battery so I can stop my gasoline consumption cold turkey. Yeah, yeah, you know, that's a really good point, but let me give you the opposite side of that. So, you know, we have a fleet of cars, right? So if mm -hmm. I wanted to, I could drive Tweety, which is, you know, our bright yellow yep. uh, 2014 <laughs> all-electric smart car. Uh, and, and I've yep. been driving that a lot. Uh, and by the way, when you're in an all-electric yellow smart car uh, and there is a um, cement truck like two feet off your ass, it's pretty freaking terrifying. I got to tell you that. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, th that was like that was like this dude was showing me who's boss <laughs> in a very serious way. And there's very little you can do about it in a in a smart for two electric car. But the bigger problem with that is that like you know the other day I, I, you know I I was driving it to work, but then I had to go to Sam's Club because I love iced tea and they sell it in bulk. And so I went up to Sam's Club, which is in Longmont, <laughs> and, then, and then I had to go uh, back. Uh, home to drop it off and then I had to go uh, uh, buy some batteries at Best uh, Buy. No, actually I was going to get some, uh, I think I was going to get some more chips because we ran out of chips. Get right? battery. How many, how many AA batteries does that smart car take? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I was going to get some <laughs> chips, uh, computer chips, right? The camera chips and I couldn't do it because I was out of range, right? Oh. It, it's only got like, I want to say like on a yep. good day when it's not cold here in Colorado, which it does get cold, it's got like six, 70 miles of range and I was like, dude, I'm not going to make it. Uh, yeah. and, and that's when, you know, the going cold turkey part uh, becomes really hard because then if I had had the yeah. RAV4, I wouldn't care. That's why going cold turkey for a lot of people need, you need that big battery. If you, if you really are going to take that leap off the cliff and it's going to be your primary car or you're going to be the married couple that's both taking the leap off the cliff. Like I know some people who only have electric cars now uh, at home and they have no gasoline vehicle, then all of a sudden you think that you need that range so that way you can make those daily daily trips or those exception trips uh, work. Yeah, and, and I know as a, you know, as an onboard journalist, I know in my head that this is a bad solution because what you're doing is carrying around a lot more weight, right? Because you're carrying around mm -hmm. two power plants, an electric motor and a gasoline engine, which adds weight, which you know uses right. more resources. Uh, so it's it's kind of a it's kind of the worst of both worlds, but at the same time it does work, you know, and you can actually yep. make it make it function in, in the and, real world for most of us. And Toyota's done a really good job at that. Like the uh, the Prius Prime that everybody loves to hate yeah. um, is I think actually an, an engineering marvel, really, to be honest, because in the United States, in North America actually, it is the second most efficient thing that runs on electricity while simultaneously being the second most efficient thing that runs on gasoline. Wow, that's um, pretty cool. So the, the, the common wisdom about plug-in hybrids being the ultimate compromise um, doesn't necessarily apply to the Prius Prime the same way that it did to the Volt, which was quite inefficient as, a, as an electric vehicle and actually quite inefficient as a hybrid vehicle when it was operating on gasoline. Um, but, you know, the Prius is like 5%, maybe 1% of what the automotive public actually wants. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It, it, it's not what you need. It's not it's sexy. What, it's, it's what you want. All right, before we get back to the uh, Rogue, and I, I, I'm sorry, Nissan, I'm getting on a tantrum here if you're listening to this, but <laughs> I want to ask you this question because I noticed a little ah. thing uh, behind you. Uh, and actually, you know, in America, you see, yeah, right there. Yeah, yeah, my little, in, in a, my little, yeah, yeah, yeah. My electric Mustang. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you're getting one. Actually, you've got two ordered, right? I ordered two, and because uh, I wasn't sure which, no one at Ford knew, it seems, that the, or wouldn't tell me which one was going to happen first. So I ordered a standard range rear wheel drive and a long range all wheel drive one from two different dealers. And then we'll just take whichever one arrives first and let the dealer have the other order. Before, um, before you do that, let me know. Maybe I'll take the other one. Oh, okay. I will, okay. I will it, it, keep it depends, you informed. It depends how these guys treat us. Ah, uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, oh, the blue, the blue pen people. Yeah, it depends how they treat us, you know, because we can we can bring a lot of recognition to that vehicle. So maybe we'll do maybe we'll do a Maki. -E. We'll see how the budget goes. But here, here, before we get back to Nissan, here's a question for you. You know, in America, I always think of America as a pendulum, right? Uh, and it's mm -hmm. the only place in the world that that actually happens, where where things like you know where, where things like go up, 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 and nothing happens, and then when it swings, it swings like fast and super hard, right? It goes to the other side. And it's, it's never like, it's never like, oh, we're here. And then, you know, here comes 
uh, the change of electrification. It's going to happen like this over the next 35 years. It's like we're here. Everybody hates electric cars. They suck. They're bad for the environment. And then all of a sudden it goes like, I want an electric car. And I think we've, we've reached that, that point now. And I'll tell you why. And I want to see if you think it's true, right? Because now we've got um, basically three cars in this segment, in this most popular mm -hmm. segment, uh, that are compete, keep competing head on, that are, um, I think, garnishing a lot of the American buyer uh, car shop retention. Of course, I'm talking about the Model Y, which is already out. Mm -hmm. And of course, the upcoming Mach E, which you're getting two of maybe, mm -hmm. or we're getting one of. And of course, the Volkswagen ID4. Yep. Uh, and the reason I say that is because when Mach E uh, orders came out, it crashed the website, right? And mm -hmm. people, and the same thing happened with the ID4. Uh, and uh, sales numbers came out and Tesla's selling the balls off of both the Model 3 and the Model Y. Uh, so do you think we've reached that inflection point? Are we, are we to the point now where, where people are saying, yeah. no longer arguing about electrifications, but now they, they want electric cars and they want them fast and they want them quick and they want them cheaply? Yeah, I don't know. We've had this discussion before. I, don't, I would argue that up till now, we haven't seen the rise of electric cars. We've seen the rise of Tesla. And that's not necessarily the same thing. Right, so right. When, you look at, when you look at battery electric vehicle sales in the United States, it's about 1%-ish. So I want to say very California, small number. California, like 4% now or 5% where you're uh, at. Most of those numbers that are high like that, in, yeah. in the national 1.8% number is including all things with plugs. That includes plug-in hybrid vehicles and battery electrics, both. Just battery electrics is a much smaller number. And 2019's total sales were actually down over 2018, which was an odd twist. And when we look at the number, things with plugs, just all of them, plug-in hybrids and battery electric vehicles, once the Model Y came on the scene, Model 3 sales started falling through the floor. So the only three vehicles in 2019 that outsold 2018 were two, two Volvo plug-in hybrids, XC90, and uh, I think the S60 plug-in hybrid had higher sales 2019 over 2018, and the Model Y. Those were the only three things with plugs that sales were up in 2019. 2020 is not a normal year, so I don't, I don't know what 2020 is going to yeah. bring us. Yeah, I agree. But I'm, 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 I'm torn on the where that's going to go. You know, Ford won't give us production estimates for, uh, for Mach-E, as I recall, and Volkswagen wouldn't really either. So how many are they going to build? I don't know. Uh, and actually, speaking of more electric vehicles, right, you just did a great review of the Polestar, but yep. uh, the Volvo version of that, which will be a crossover, actually started yes. production. And will uh, be and coming, coming to the U.S. Out. Yeah, that's coming as well and soon. Um, and to so. real, real actual dealers where you can <laughs> yeah. go in and actually buy one. But not pop-up dealers at the local mall? <laughs> <laughs> not, not fancy pop-up dealers and... And, uh, and of course, that one, I think, has a little bit more cachet because those uh, some of the detractors that will say, I'm not going to buy a car made in China, you know, maybe they'll buy the Volvo version that's made in Belgium instead. Yeah, yeah. And then, uh, like I said, you know, the other thing I would say uh, is in Europe, in a lot of the countries, that, that shift has certainly happened, right? You look at the Scandinavian yes. countries, those guys have gone electric all in. And, and I think the fear from a lot of people is range anxiety. Uh, because, of course, they're afraid of that Easter I just had where they want to go do something and they can't do it. Uh, mm -hmm. And then, of course, you know, being early adopters uh, mm -hmm. and whether, you know, they can charge up as quickly and as easily. Uh, but, but what you learn when you have an electric car is that those really aren't issues unless you have like, a, you know, a six-year-old smart right. car that only has 70 miles of range. When you get into that, like, yeah. like you know, if you notice like the new, like 500 with Lucid has become the new 400 miles of range, right? It just keeps increasing. Yes. We'll see. I mean, we'll see how believable their range is in the end. Yeah. It looks good on paper. Uh, it's all about efficiency. So, um, but, it's but like I've had, I've had an electric, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like my first electric car uh, was the uh, the Soul EV with 95, 90, 95 miles of EPA range. That was definitely a, a tight squeeze. Yeah. Um, there were some things that I, you know, tried to do in one package in one day that I could not complete uh, with the Soul EV. So, 200, I think, would be a little bit better. 200 is more workable, really. Um, but we'll see. We'll see how the sales go. Um, it's like you know. I wonder. I wonder if Ford crashing and all of that was it that they just weren't prepared. I mean, they so they got five thousand pre-orders and that crashed their dealy. Um, I mean, if if they got Tesla like pre-order numbers, I would be shocked. Like Absolutely. cyber truck like six hundred thousand. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, I doubt. I doubt their pre-orders were in that that window. 
Um, but that said, uh, you know, I, the rumor mill is saying that Ford's going to be prepared to build, I think, 60-something thousand mach in the first model year, which is fairly aggressive. Um, it's not, mo- not Model Y aggressive, though. Yeah, no, no. Model Y is certainly um, going to be uh, mm-hmm. Tesla's uh, money model. It's going to be their Model T. But uh, the no. other thing, the other thing that people might be thinking, well, how about like the fact that let's go back to Nissan. The Nissan came out with the Leaf. It's been ten years ago. You know, it's, it, for a long time, it was the best-selling electric car in the entire world. I would mm-hmm. say that the Leaf, sorry, Nissan, was just a, a swing and a miss. You know, uh, and you kept yep. pushing it. I think, I think, um, and, and the same thing to GM with the Bolt, right? Uh, mm-hmm. So the here's just some some things that I consider uh, that that I don't understand about both those vehicles, right? The reason that small economy cars are front-wheel drive is because of packaging, right? It allows you to put more mm-hmm. um, yep. space in the passenger compartment. Uh, but it's much better in most applications to push a car with the rear wheels and have the front wheel steer it. So you're not doing two things with those front wheels. Uh, it just, it just, from an engineering point of view, it just works much better. And there's no yeah, reason driving that, dynamics. Yeah, yeah. There's no reason that, that an electric car should be front wheel drive, right? Ah, uh-huh. because the, uh, the logic. Well, there, there is, there is, right, be, there is bean countery logic. Well, there, not, there is regen. Absolutely, logic. absolutely not fun to drive logic. The bean countery logic is. Uh, you can use it on an existing platform, so you'd have to redesign the cr- the crash structures mainly uh, in trying to put a motor in the back of, say, a yeah, Nissan but the, Sentra. But the Leaf was a, from scratch, you know. Ah, no, it wasn't. It's related to all the other front wheel drive Nissans out there. Mm. It's part of part of the global Nissan platform family. But are you saying? Are you saying it shares a chassis with like a Versa or? Uh, it shares. Yeah, it shares crash structures with Nissan's other compact vehicles worldwide. And that's the big thing. So the front crash structures and rear crash structures and suspension designs, all common with Nissan's uh, other front-wheel drive products. Um, clearly, the, they didn't just, just take a center because the, where the battery is located and everything in the vehicle, they couldn't just do that and, and squeeze an electric motor in it. But, uh, but there's a high degree of commonality in the, especially the crash structure designs of the vehicle. And that's why you see... Um, a lot of those front wheel drive things. That's why like the mini E, the mini electric thing, um, that's why it has all those weird tubes around the electric motor in the front in the engine compartment, because that that allows it to still crush and meet those crash standards like a gasoline engine vehicle. So they did not tweak the body and the crash structures yeah. to accommodate the different size and crash characteristics of the motor. They made the motor module adapt to that. But there's also the reality that you're still gonna have radiators up front and all that packaging that goes on up front. So there's some logic in jamming the motor all in that area and maybe giving us more cargo room in the back. I'm not sure Nissan has any radiators up front, right? Those batteries aren't climate controlled. They're just... They're no, the air conditioning air conditioning radiator right. yeah, okay. so for the cli- climate control radiator and that kind of thing. But, but I'm saying um, if, if, you design it from a, if you design it from scratch, right, like Tesla did, then mm-hmm. what you end up with is a frunk. Uh, and that's, right, that's right. ultimately really useful. You know, you've got two mm-hmm. areas for storage. Uh, oh, they definitely revolutionized, revolutionized the frunk for sure. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, and then uh, you also have, I think, a much better driving dynamic because then you you mm-hmm. you know you make you make it push and steer versus pull and steer. Now there is right. an argument I think to be made, and I, I heard this from one of the engineers that with a front wheel drive motor, uh, you can get better regen, right? Because most when you're when yes. you're right, most of the braking in a there's car logic takes- for having a motor up front wherever you whatever you do, yeah. But, but, and the and the braking dynamics are going to be better rather than dragging the rear wheels to be braking on the front. Um, but there's also, I mean, a tiny bit of pragmatic logic here in that if you had a, a torsion beam, you know, non-independent rear suspension in your front wheel drive compact cheapy hatch, that you could have more cargo capacity total by jamming the engine up front, not worrying about a frunk and just having a really big, crazy flat load floor. There's some logic in that, but obviously not fun. And, you know, you brought this up, and I'm sure people out there who are Mini fans, so I'm going to ask a question. What do you think of the Mini E? It's built on the i3 platform, right? So Yeah, I loved it. I, yeah, thought it cool, was, huh? I thought it was the best Mini ever. This is what all Minis should be. Um, it was fast. It was peppy. It's funky. Um, it has some miles of, standard. 120 miles of range. Eh, Supposedly, okay. most Mini drivers have at least two to three other vehicles, and a lot of Mini drivers are using their Minis, according to BMW. Um, as commuter cars. So they have other BMWs and they're buying this Mini for, for quirky cute commutiness. Um, so in that vein, I think it makes a lot of sense. And, su- um, and super and affordable. Cheap. Yeah, super. Cheap. It's like if you can get one for, um, 
you know, if you can get the one that's not with all the bells and whistles, it's like 30K, right? 29, it yeah. starts at. And 29. Then you, yeah, and after all, the, after all the credits, you can get it down to about 20,000 in some states. Yeah. So it's yeah. cheap. And what $20,000 car can you buy in America right now that comes standard with summer tires? <laughs> None. That's, that's part of its range problem. They, they were like, you know, oh, low rolling resistance tires as if. <laughs> and and if, you want, out. if you want to see a good review of, of that vehicle, go to Alex's website. Uh, he did a really great job on it. Uh, I, I, I loved it. Uh, you know, the, the only problem I have with the Mini E is that electric cars, you, you're lucky in California, right? You got all those compliance cars, uh, which, mm -hmm. you know, legislation, let's be fair. Lucky, yeah, yeah, lucky yeah. to get compliance cars. Well, they were forced. They were forced on California. <laughs> they weren't. Yes. The manufacturers built them because they had to, not because they wanted right. to. Uh, and then eventually they kind of dispersed throughout the rest of the country. We, Of all places, we got our... Uh, our little uh, smart car, Tweety, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, dude. In t who would have oh. thought you'd get a... Wow. <laughs> yeah. Oh, hey. it's, it's not exactly, uh, you know, Paris, right, in terms yeah. of the yeah, parking yeah. situation. <laughs> but but those cars have now proliferated uh, the rest of the country, right? So you can right. get them. Uh, and they're dirt cheap, right? And a lot they of them are. are really cool. Like the, the 500E, the Fiat 500E is really torquey. Uh, mm -hmm. Not a lot of range, but really fun to drive. Uh, and so... So you can get a brand new, you know, Mini E, or you can get for seven thousand a five hundred E, and that's yep. thirteen less than even the discounted. It's pretty yep. crazy how cheap I they mean, are. And they make they make a reasonable amount of sense. You know, speaking of living out here on the left coast, um, you know, California is a big place. A lot of people that are on the eastern seaboard and even in the middle of the U.S. don't realize how big California really is. Um, you know, it's like I happen to have a hydrogen car at the moment and a lot of people were saying, well, my goodness, you could never leave California in your hydrogen car. And it's like, yeah, I, I am not driving if I leave California. The closest way, closest exit for me out is about four hours. Um, and if I wanted to go out the, the south side, it's like an eight hour odyssey. So there's no way I'm, I'm flying. It's, I'm not driving. Yeah, I, you know, I, that we, strikes me as... I was saying that strikes me as interesting, though, because in the Bay Area, you see a lot of Teslas. And in Los Angeles, you see a lot of Teslas. But now that COVID is here and I'm driving to press events rather than flying, I'm not seeing Teslas very often on Highway 101 or I-5, the main routes from those two major metro areas in California. And I'm betting that that's because people that are choosing to do that take their gasoline car. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. I mean, why do you want to, uh, you know, make a, make a trip... It depends how long it is, but you know, you're going to extend mm -hmm. it by hours potentially. Yep. And it's, it can be interesting, you know, sitting there watching uh, your Tesla charge or like if you're in a place like Laramie, Wyoming, where there's nothing but <laughs> yep. you know, a, a, a hotel uh, and, a, and one vending machine, it can be pretty freaking boring. And you're right. And as, you know, as you discovered, nobody's towing a trailer with their Tesla either. No, no, that's a whole <laughs> other, we should have that other, that, 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 I'm calling that's a whole other video. That's a pickup truck problem. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, the next, though, which you have, we were lucky enough to have sent over here. And I, Alex, I spent probably a week trying to figure out how to, how to get it filled up here. And there are places in Colorado where they have uh, hydrogen stations, uh, but either because of COVID or because of technicalities, I couldn't find a place to charge yep. it up. So we had one tank full, we used it up, and then we sent it back to California. And you, you, can't, you can't build a business on that. Yep. You can't, yep. Sell, you can't sell cars on that. Uh, so speaking of the Nexo, what, let's talk about that. I love the Nexo. I thought it was so cool. How, how, how is yours? Are you, what's, what's it like living with the hydrogen-powered car? It's actually been fine. Um, I one of the one of the trips to, uh, actually to drive the uh, Chevy Tahoe. I drove the Nexo down down to uh, Orange County to drive the Tahoe for for our, our pre embargo review, um, and that highlighted the just the ease of of using it in that idealistic world where all the stations are perfectly aligned for you. Uh, so I left my office, uh, and then you know three hundred miles later, I filled up in Santa Barbara, and then. Went to Orange County. I took four, four or five minutes to fill up. Went to Orange County. Came back to Santa Barbara. Filled it up again. And then, you know, four and a half hours later, I was in at home. Um, didn't have to stop for charging. Still had 80 miles of, of hydrogen left in the car. Um, it fits that gasoline replacement lifestyle perfectly. But all the hydrogen all the hydrogen car manufacturers figured out, uh, or, or sorry, didn't figure out what Tesla figured out, which is you got to have somewhere to fill it. Yes. So. Honda and Hyundai and Toyota, their factory line is 
you know, we don't build gas stations for our gasoline powered cars. Why should we build hydrogen stations for the hydrogen cars? Because you have to fill them somewhere. That's why. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what last count, there were less than 50 hydrogen stations in all of California, which you yes, know, is somewhere is, around there. And there was a, there were supposed to be about 120 by the end of this year, but COVID got in the way. And uh, there are a number opening, however, still. So uh, in my neck of the woods, San Jose is going to go from one hydrogen station to three, supposedly by December. Um, and there'll, there'll be another one on my route home, but none in the county that I live in. Uh, you, at zero. So hydrogen is very similar to, to gasoline, right? You fill it up in about the same amount of time. Uh, it's mm -hmm. crazy expensive. So <laughs> luckily when you uh, lease a hydrogen car, the manufacturer gives you yep. a credit card to help you offset that cost. Have you ever had to wait to fill it up? Besides, no. the, besides the time when there was an explosion and they shut down all the stations? No, never had to wait. Um, cool. Because they cross, cars go through the hydrogen stations pretty rapidly. Um, and even in the, hang on a second, my battery, this is my battery's low. I need uh oh, to... well, we're almost done anyway. So we, we're, we're, we, we've, we've definitely gone over them out of a lot of time. Uh -huh. Don't lose your, don't lose it. Did you plug it in? It was already plugged in, but I'm guessing it doesn't like my power adapter or something. Uh, Will it last another well, five minutes? I think so. Yeah. So okay. we'll just, we'll pretend it's not happening. All right, let's, um, finish, let's, let's finish this up. Let's, let's go back to the Rogue and, and, uh, and finish this guy up. So um, okay. the new Rogue, um, once again, if you want to see Alex's review, go to his channel or go to our channel today. Uh, did they do what they needed to do to make it, uh, you know, one of the top uh, sellers in the country? I think they did because uh, Nissan's pushing real hard on their active safety technologies that are standard across the Rogue's lineup. Um, they're, they're going at it a bit differently than Honda and Toyota. So rather than giving radar adaptive cruise control, they put blind spot monitoring and rear cross traffic detection on standard. But anyway, you slice it, there's a ton of active safety stuff on there. Um, and then one trim level up from the bottom, you get even more. So you get the full suite of things on that next level. Um, it has a big cargo area. It's fuel efficient. Um, they're pushing some of their, their passive and other safety items. Like it's the only entry in a segment to have load levelers and pretensioners uh, in on the seat belts in the second row, uh, which normally you only find on luxury cars, et cetera. And there's some extra airbags here and there and everywhere inside. So they're pushing real hard on the family friendliness, family focusing, uh, big cargo area, kid friendliness, all of that, which I think does their market pretty well. And that was one area where the Rogue always outperformed the RAV4 before. So I think that's gonna continue. Um, I'm sure some shoppers out there are going to hate the CVT. It's not the best CVT ever. It's not a Honda CVT, which I think is one of the better ones out there right now. Um, but, you know, it's it gets you from point A to point B in nine-ish seconds, zero to 60. Yeah. So, um, you know, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, I'm a fan of Nissan. They've had uh, a lot of struggles recently, uh, you know, with their whole... Well, that's a, that's a whole nother podcast. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's good to see that they maybe are finding uh, their way back to actually yep. manufacturing, you know, something that is, uh, 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 you know, class leading, right? I mean, it yep. sounds like you're saying this, this is one of the be better. It's one of the best. Yeah. Cars. Yeah. There. And I think it's, you know, honestly, so many cars in this segment really sell on looks and it looks really good in person. I okay. like, I like the new square front end. I like the front end design. Um, I, you know, if it's selling on looks alone, this is one of the better looking options. I think the the, you know, CX-5 is still the sexiest, but it boy, is the CX-5 tiny inside. Well, guys, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Alex, for, uh, you know, taking up uh, an hour of uh, my time with your uh, great uh, conversation. I really enjoyed it. Uh, and like I said, if you want to see Andre on a pink girl's bike, we'll do <laughs> <laughs> we'll put the link below. It's a towing video of all things. Uh, <laughs> what is he towing with this pink bike? He's towing the pink bike. We, we needed more oh, he's weight. He's towing the pink bike. Yeah. I get it. Yeah, we did. Okay. We did. A, we did a video. You know, we had a. a, a this is crazy, dude. Uh, we had a um, Atlas Cross, um, mm -hmm. and um, we were to tow with it, and we undid the little thing, and it had a European uh, style. Uh, oh, bike. and I'm like. Because this is a car made in America for mm. Americans. Why are they putting a European style plug into it? Yeah, that's weird. And then that's we weird. To, and that, it was with the tow package. And then we had to go to the, the VW dealership and buy the adapter for fifty-seven dollars to actually make it work. You know, into the wow. seven pin, into the American seven pin plug. <clears throat> and then we needed huh. more weight, so we put Andrea on a pink girl's bike and stuck him on the trailer. 
You know, the uh, the Polestar 2 has the full European, uh, you know, hitch that looks sort of a little phallic. And yeah, yeah, it yeah. Has those, the, those weird the, ones that look the other. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, like, it's, 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 like, the, it's like this, yeah. Looks yeah, like, like that. that. And it and it ha it's electrically retractable in the Polestar 2. And they kept that for the American market, which is hilarious. You know, the, the, um, the, the Vol Volvo wagon. It's put a two-inch ball on it. The Volvo wagon does that, too. It's got a little button and it falls down. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Most of the European do that. They're retractable mm -hmm. in America. Yeah. It's not a thing. I don't know why. They don't. They don't always come to America in that same format. But the Polestar Two does, which is cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they're ahead in that regard, at least hiding the tow hitch. Maybe it's because yeah. uh, maybe it's because they use a lot less tongue weight in Europe, right? We we go yes. with 10 per, we go with ten percent tongue weight, and so you need a beefier mm -hmm. hitch or 15%, mm -hmm. they go with, you know, you've got these like little tiny Hyundai diesels, yep. these massive trailers, and you couldn't do that in America because there's just too much tongue right. weight on it. Yeah. Low, low speed limits, because, you know, if, you have a, if you're at a really low speed, your chances of, of, of having trailer instability drop really, really quickly. Yeah, uh, what is Ken, it's called trailer sway, but what does Ken call it? Oh, the Elvis pelvis, that's what Ken calls it. Yeah, yeah, the Elvis, yeah, you don't want that, you don't want that. Um, and that's that's part of why California, for instance, has a 55 mile an hour towing speed limit, because studies show that that above about 60 miles an hour, the uh, the likelihood of, of trailer sway starts to increase exponentially. It's not a linear relationship, it actually, it actually is an exponential style relationship. And, and people may think it's funny until you have it happen to you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Whew. You do, do not want the trailer wagging the dog. You know, that is, that is not a good thing. <laughs> there, there are plenty of YouTube videos that show what happens when that goes awry. I had, I had no <laughs> moment once of towing, towing a car on a car trailer with my old Saab 97X Arrow. Ooh, ooh, that was bad. Yeah, yeah. Not, then you're no longer the driver. You're the passenger. It was and, some brown and, trousers time. Yeah. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, well, thank you for uh, joining us uh, for uh, this episode of uh, Talking Cars. And Alex, thank you for joining us. And remember, uh, check out, if you're watching this, uh, you can also listen to it uh, on Apple Podcasts. And if you ah. listen to it, uh, then you can also see it on YouTube. So either way it works. Uh, you know, on Apple Podcasts, you don't see uh, Alex's new studio. Oops. <laughs> there it goes. I think it died, guys. Bye, Alex. Got it just in time. All right. See you guys next time. Ciao.